Good morning. I'm State Representative Daryl Metcalf, Chairman of the House State Government Committee, and I'm joined by all of the folks that you see behind me, uh, fellow legislators, uh, uh, members uh, of the legislature, and we are also joined by uh, many folks from the private sector, uh, several of which you'll be hearing from today regarding the regulatory environment in Pennsylvania and specifically a regulatory package of legislation, regulatory reform legislation that we are introducing and announcing here today. Uh, we have a regulatory overreach report that's been generated by the House State Government Committee and the hearings uh, that we had earlier um, in this session last June. We had a series of hearings uh, both uh, regarding the overall regulatory environment and also hearings that were focusing on activities of the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, who is uh, one of our poster um, organizations for uh, regulatory reform. So we will be making these available today, um, but you're going to hear from prime sponsors of the package of legislation. You're also going to hear from, uh, as I said, those on the outside, um, from the outside groups that are supporting um, this reform legislative package. Uh, we have uh, with us Dr. James Brule here today. He's a re research fellow at the Mercatus Center at James Madison University. And Dr. Brule had testified before the committee, and we thought that uh, it would be very good for him to be here today uh, to share some information uh, regarding regulatory reform as we uh, talk about the package that we're introducing. Uh, Dr. Brule. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's actually George Mason University, but that, that's quite all right. Um, so a few months ago, I produced a report about the regulatory environment in Pennsylvania. We found out, among other things, that the Pennsylvania Code has about 13 million words in it, over 153,000 of which are restrictive words, like shall, must, or required, that can signify requirements of various, kind, various kinds. It would take an individual about 18 weeks to read the entire Pennsylvania Code. We also learned that Pennsylvania has a higher restriction count than some of its neighbors, such as West Virginia or Maryland, though not quite as high as some other nearby states like New York. Now, the reason this is important is because of the effect that regulation can have on economic growth and, by extension, living standards. Michael Mandel, who's an economist at the Progressive Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., likens the effect of regulation on the economy to dropping pebbles in a water stream. That first pebble may be insignificant, but a thousand pebbles can slow the flow of the stream, and a hundred thousand pebbles might dam up the stream, even, if the, even though that last pebble was also insignificant by itself. Pennsylvania has a fairly sophisticated modern system when it comes to reviewing new regulation, but the state could do more uh, to analyze the consequences of all the old regulations on the books. In that sense, Pennsylvania can learn from uh, other states like Kentucky, Nebraska, Missouri, and Illinois that are prioritizing the review of regulations on the books. Uh, Pennsylvania could also consider whether a policy like one in, one out makes sense, where an old regulation is removed for each new one introduced. This is the approach being followed by states like Texas, as well as other countries like the United Kingdom and Canada. So today, I'm very excited to see that Regulatory reform is a priority in Pennsylvania, and my hope is that this will lead to more economic growth and more opportunity for Pennsylvania residents. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brule, with George Mason at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Our next speaker is going to be Representative Hill, and she is the author of one of the main bills in the package. Good morning, and thank you to Chairman Metcalf for inviting me to speak on my legislation. Pennsylvania is drowning in red tape. In testimony presented earlier this year to the House State Government Committee, we heard that Pennsylvania has over 153,000 regulatory restrictions in its administrative code. While some restrictions are vital for protecting the health and safety of our citizens, others just make the code unnecessarily complicated. Surely, some of these restrictions are not necessary for safeguarding our public health, safety, or the environment. Overregulation significantly increases the cost of doing business in the Commonwealth, and these costs inhibit job creation. 
Ask anyone who owns a small business, who tries to start a new business here in the Commonwealth, who serves in local government, or just moves here from out of state. To address these challenges, I've introduced House Bill 209, which would establish an Office of the Repealer. The Office of the Repealer would do what the legislature has been unable to do, conduct an independent review of existing regulations that fall under the headings of burdensome, duplicative, and outdated. The position would also be charged with bringing statutes up to date, fostering a more business-friendly climate, and making laws easier for our citizens to read and understand. The office would function in a similar capacity to the already existing Independent Regulatory Review Commission, but that entity only evaluates proposed regulations. The Office of the Repealer would review and evaluate current regulations already on the books from a 21st century perspective and address onerous and burdensome mandates that restrict our efficiency, our effectiveness, and economic progress. Additionally, I will be offering an amendment to my bill that will establish a process that will sunset many outdated and onerous regulations that inhibit the growth of our economy. For every new regulation that an agency proposes, two existing regulations must also be offered for repeal. We've seen great success at the federal level through the President's executive order for regulatory reform that contained the same requirement. The result at the federal level has been 16 rules and regulations eliminated for every one created, saving our federal taxpayers over $8.1 billion in less than a year. Lastly, this act will sunset in five years. With the comprehensive regulatory reform package being offered here today by my colleagues, the Office of the Repealers ex existence should no longer be necessary once it does its job of cleaning up our existing rules and regulations. I'd like to thank the 19 House members who've signed on to the bill thus far. And again, thank Chairman Metcalf for this forum to bring these essential pieces of legislation in front of the public. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Mr. Kevin Shivers. He's the Executive Director of the National Federation of Independent Business in Pennsylvania. Chairman Metcalf and the members of the committees uh, and the lawmakers uh, here behind me, thank you and uh, good morning to all of you. My organization uh, here in Pennsylvania, NFIB, represents about 15,000 small and independent businesses. Uh, the common denominator for our members is that they're not publicly traded companies. Uh, they are all closely held or family owned businesses. Many of them organize as sole proprietors or subchapter S or LLC companies. And many of them <clears throat> are very small. The average small business starts with about a, a mini median amount of, of resource, about 18 thousand uh, dollars you can't get a loan to start a small business at that level so typically what you're doing is you're borrowing money from your family or your friends or you're taking money out of your retirement uh, or your children's uh, uh, college tuition accounts uh, and you're investing that in an effort in your community because you found a problem in your community and you found a solution uh, and that your business is going to provide uh, whether it's uh, dry cleaning or a local restaurant maybe it's a tool and die uh, uh, facility or some other small manufacturer or retail shop um, you're not looking to become the next bill gates you're looking to provide a sustainable uh, living for your family and maybe a sustainable living for other families in your community. But these businesses, by virtue of their size, are especially sensitive to regulatory changes uh, because in most instances it is the owner uh, who is reviewing regulations or trying to deal with compliance issues. Uh, it takes an inordinate amount of time and energy away from growing the business, creating jobs, creating sales. Uh, and here in Pennsylvania, uh, it's like a wet blanket on the economic engine that is small business. Uh, small businesses in Pennsylvania account for over half of the private private sector jobs in our state, uh, and they are struggling. 
What's extraordinary to me is when you take a look at other areas of government, say for example permitting, where a company can't get a permit because the regulators, the people that are in those agencies complain that they don't have enough resources to do the job, the permitting, et cetera. But the question then becomes, if agencies don't have the necessary resources to do their jobs, then why are they doing the other regulations or trying to enforce regulations uh, beyond their abilities? If they don't have resources currently to do the things that they're supposed to do, why do they want to do more? Uh, we've been grateful to Chairman Metcalf and the members of this of his committee and the uh, General Assembly generally, who we have talked to over a number of weeks and months. Um, Chairman Metcalf actually met with uh, NFIB's Leadership Council uh, back in the spring to talk about a number of rules and regulations that were um, uh, struggling, you know, businesses were struggling with. Uh, other representatives uh, were there as, as well. Uh, and uh, we're delighted with this package. We're delighted that small businesses had the opportunity to be included and to be at the table in developing the legislative package, and uh, we're giving it our full-throated support. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kevin Shivers with the uh, NFIB in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have the report that I mentioned earlier at the start, and the categories that we created for the findings that came out of the hearings last year are essentially three categories. The first category is to try and ensure that um, and, and reform the regulatory environment so that the regulators actually will work in a collaborative fashion with those who are being regulated rather than a punitive fashion. It's much better if you can work in a collaborative educational type manner with those being regulated than in a punitive fashion that, uh, that harms everybody's interests. Um, we have a gentleman uh, with us this morning, uh, Mr. Pete Ramsey, um, president of the Pennsylvania Tough Grass Council. He's grounds manager for Messiah College, and he's also superintendent for Range End Golf Club. And uh, Mr. Ramsey had testified before us and, and brought some of these concerns to us as a committee, and we we're really pleased this morning that he was able to make it through the weather and make time in his day to join us to share a few words with everybody this morning on why we need regulatory reform in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I apologize. I'm still mourning the loss of the Pennsylvania Super Bowl. <laughs> so my team did not hold up to its end of the bargain. But uh, thank you for having me today. Um, the golf industry and, uh, and sports turf, athletic fields, uh, account for in excess of a $3 billion industry in Pennsylvania. It employs well over 100,000 people. Um, golf course superintendents and agronomists uh, on the athletic field side, um, many of those are uh, civil servants at the municipal level for athletic fields and school districts. Um, and I would argue that reform can occur, and we have very good relationships with um, some legislative bodies in Pennsylvania. Uh, turf managers have a great relationship with DEP. DEP was smart enough to ask us to work with them on drought reform regulations. Um, we helped author um, some of the Act 220 reporting in some of the droughts we went through in the 90s and early 2000s. The Department of Agriculture, there are people from the Turf Grass Council that sit on the Pesticide Advisory Board. Um, they have worked with us on pesticide legislation and reporting, um, also uh, fertilizer legislation that's upcoming and worked with Penn State University. Um, those agencies have, have worked very well with us and have utilized us and our expertise to help write legislation and reform legislation that produces real change, but is something that we can, as municipalities and as small business owners still live with. Um, on the flip side, we look at regulation a little bit differently. Regulation is coming from organizations that are not necessarily legislative bodies, uh, such as the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. Um, we're all considered to be consumptive users, um, and we are all at the mercy of an organization that so far has no legislative oversight. Um, many People in golf are small business owners, um, or they're at equity clubs that are nonprofit clubs. Uh, we do not have a large um, 
lobbying presence. This is a grassroots effort for us to try and uh, work with them. But again, we are, we are at the mercy of an organization that, that does not really have to justify what it's doing to us. Um, and we need, we need legislative help to do that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Pete Ramsey, for joining us today. We have two additional categories beyond the category to make the regulated environment more collaborative and educational instead of punitive. The other two categories are dealing with current regulations, and then the third category is to deal with future regulations that can deter investment and ultimately obstruct job creation. So we have a bill that's been introduced by Representative Benninghoff, and he's the policy chairman for the Republican caucus, and uh, Carrie's here with us today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time to be here. Uh, as many of you know, last year the policy committee had four, nine different hearings across the state trying to gather information, uh, very valuable information from business owners, from workers, educators, and alike, trying to find out what we can do better here in Pennsylvania, what we may be doing well, but more importantly, about what we can do to stimulate more job growth. Um, in a moment, I'll talk based regarding my bill, but I just want to say today's hearing is kind of a collection of efforts by the State Government Committee along with policy and many of its members, but more importantly, my opinion is it's about putting a face on this issue. This is an issue about jobs, and it's about being able to help our friends and family's neighbors be employable. Uh, we heard Mr. Ramsey speak. Mr. Ramsey leaves his job today and is not making money when he's standing here trying to say to the government, please don't regulate me out of business. They lose time, they lose money. The important thing we hear is we want government to be working for the people. Well, we believe that as well. We also think it should be done by those who are elected to do that, and not necessarily by bureaucrats in regulatory areas. Specifically, my bill 1792 is part of a package that Chairman uh, Metcalf has put together. Under the current law, Regulatory Review Act allows the General Assembly to block the implementation of regulations before it takes event. A concurrent resolution approved by the governor will block the implementation of a proposed legislation. This legislation will simply extend this process to regulations that are currently in effect. Furthermore, my legislation will prohibit the repealed regulation from being implemented in future and less done by the law, done by the lawmakers who are elected by the people. We've heard earlier by several other speakers these similar acts are occurring on the congressional level, and we see that this has been very fruitful uh, for the president as they try to block some of these anti-business regulations, and we believe that this would be good for Pennsylvania. At the end of the day, my friends, this is about helping our citizens, our friends, our families, our neighbors, helping our employers keep them employed, giving them good family sustaining jobs, and it should be done by the lawmakers elected, not by regulars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Benninghoff. Next speaker will be Ms. Angela Zayden, and Ms. Zayden is the government affairs person for Pennsylvania Manufacturing and Business Association. Good morning. I represent the Manufacturer and Business Association. Uh, we are a regional employers association that represents more than 300 member companies across uh, 27, state, or 27 counties. We have offices in Erie and Harrisburg, and we're dedicated to providing information and services to our members that will assist them in the pursuit of their businesses. The MBA stands for the Protection, Support, and Expansion of the American Free Enterprise System. First, I would like to thank uh, Representative Benninghoff for spearheading this regulatory reform effort. I'd also, like to I'd also like to thank all of the other representatives that have introduced legislation and the co-sponsors that will be um, supporting this as well. Uh, a favorable business climate is essential for the expansion of the economy, the creation of new products and additional jobs, and the prosperity for our state. Not all regulations are unjustified and the issue then becomes um, how to enable the regulatory system to provide for the concerns without unreasonably impeding the innovation, research development, and product deployment. The regulatory burdens can cause substantial economic harm by reducing the economic growth, slowing job growth, harming businesses, and stunning new business growth. The actual effects depend, uh, vary depending on the type of regulation. However, in a globally competitive marketplace, manufacturers need a regulatory system 
that is focused on real priorities and removes unnecessary obstacles to the economic growth. Overreaching regulations are now at a historical high in our country and in Pennsylvania. Reducing the number of regulations, reviewing existing regulations and making the necessary changes to them, reviewing the cost associated with current regulations, and having agency accountability and consistency is essential for a pro-growth economy. This regulatory package does exactly that. We commend the legislators who recognize the businesses and manufacturers are currently overregulated, and we look forward to working with them to correct the problems with the hopes of making Pennsylvania a better place to do business in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Aiden, with the uh, Pennsylvania Manufacturer and Business Association. Our next speaker will be Representative Greg Rothman, and Representative Rothman has legislation that's part of the package that he'll be talking to you about, but we're also joined by other members of the legislature that I mentioned earlier, and some of those members uh, that you won't be hearing from today at the microphone, but that are supportive of the package and are here to, in support are Representative Seth Grove, Representative Frank Ryan, uh, Representative Steve Bloom, uh, we have our Majority Whip, Representative Brian Cutler, who is here, Representative Chris Dush, uh, Representative Stan Saylor as our Appropriations Chairman from the Republican Caucus. You'll be hearing from Representative Saylor, uh, Representative Brett Miller, Representative Paul Schemmel, and Representative Dan Mao, who has also been very active in introducing legislation to deal with the over-regulatory arm of the government. Uh, now, Representative Greg Rothman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, as, we, as we deal with um, the burdensome regulations and we can uh, debate whether or not these regulations um, you know, how, what regulations are necessary and what aren't, and how they affect business in our state. I want to talk about permanine, and specifically paralysis by permanine. Uh, the, the colleagues who, who were just named, my colleagues, uh, make up, some of them make up part of a, a new group called the Common Sense Caucus. And I want to tell a story about uh, my 28 years before the legislature in real estate, one of the first properties I bought uh, was directly across from the Capitol in Wormleysburg, uh, with a, on a direct access to the Capitol, beautiful view of the Capitol. And there were two shade trees. And I got a letter the day I purchased the property from the borough saying that my shade, one of my two shade trees was dead and that I would have to have it cut down or I'd be in violation of the, the ordinance. So I called and said, well, what do I need to do to cut it down? And they said, well, you need a permit, and that's issued by the Shade Tree Commission. So I actually had to go to get a permit to cut down a tree that I was told was, was dead. Well, imagine if that's just on a local level what businesses have to do, deal with, with the state as far as permitting. And we know, as we heard, you know, the time value of money a delay in the permitting process costs money. It costs money to the businesses, it costs money to our economy, and ultimately it costs money to the state because we're not receiving the tax money. So my bill provides two things, uh, transparency in permitting, uh, which will uh, require the state, all state agencies that, that, that issue permits to uh, put on their website, and have a tracking system, uh, just like at uh, Christmas time or the holidays when you purchased a, a product from Amazon, you were able to track immediately after purchasing where it was in the supply chain and it, where, it, where it was in the delivery chain. So the same way that, that those who are applying for a permit will have the ability to track where they are in the process. And if a, a permit is delayed or denied, uh, the actual statute or the, the law or the regulation that is the reason the permit hasn't been issued would have to be identified by the state agency. So uh, while we're reforming the, the regulation process and, and maybe make it easier, e easier for businesses to operate to create jobs in Pennsylvania, at least uh, we owe it to those people that are investing in our state uh, that they would know where they are in the process and also why their permits are being withheld. So uh, my bill is House Bill uh, 1959, and I would appreciate everyone's support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Greg Rothman. Our next speaker is going to be Mr. Jim Welty, and he is Vice President of Government Affairs for the Marcellus Shale Coalition. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marcellus Shale Coalition, we represent about 220 producers, midstream companies, and supply chain companies doing business in the Commonwealth, particularly with the shale plays, uh, both the Marcellus and Utica shale plays and other shale plays. Uh, developing about 95% of the natural gas is what our members do uh, in Pennsylvania. So we are constantly representing them up here with the challenges that we are facing from an economic standpoint. And it's no secret that we've had a very challenging economic times over the last several years. But we're cautiously optimistic that we're starting to see a turn 
uh, in, in the economy. And we're hopeful that 2018 provides that turn so that we can invest more capital in the Commonwealth and hire more individuals in the Commonwealth. But that does not take away from the fact that we are in a very competitive environment. There are shale plays all across this globe. There are shale plays all across this country. And in fact, you don't need to, you, you know, you're not blind to the fact that every time you open up a paper, you see more investment going to other states, and in particular, the Permian Basin in West Texas uh, in Eastern New Mexico is sucking up a lot of that capital. We are in competition for that capital and for those jobs. But that's why we need policies in this Commonwealth that encourage growth and, dos and don't discourage growth. Both tax policy and regulatory policies are very important to ensuring that that capital and those jobs are created here in Pennsylvania for the natural gas industry. What we're seeing right now are delays and inconsistencies on the regulatory level. Um, and while we're working with the administration to address these delays, it still doesn't take from the fact that, for example, uh, to receive a well permit in statute, it's required that they must issue that permit within 45 days. And while the time frame has come down, we're still seeing, on average, over 100 days to, to receive that well permit. So think about that. The law is 45 days, but it's taken us over 100 days. Again, that time frame has come down, and they're starting to work through the backlog, but we still have a challenge. Those permits lead to capital. And it, again, it's not just delays, it's inconsistencies in the process. Uh, if you take, for example, simple earth moving permits, these are permits that not just our industry receive, but other industries must get if they're going to move any earth. Um, you can see throughout the Commonwealth there's a number of different regions. In some regions it takes, while, while DEP's own policy says 14 days to receive those earth moving permits, in some regions it takes over 200 days, in other regions it takes 80 days. So there's no consistency that we see throughout the, the, the Commonwealth. And finally, what we know is that there is constantly an appetite to regulate and regulate and regulate. And we want to make sure that any regulations that come in the future, that there's a statutory authority to do so, that the departments aren't regulating on their own, but they're receiving the direction from the General Assembly. Much more needs to be done to improve the regulatory process in Pennsylvania. And let me be clear, this is not a Wolf administration issue. This issue goes back for several administrations. But we do know that this continues to be a problem, and it's affecting capital and it's affecting investment. So we look forward to working with the members of the stage here and the legislature to address these issues through this package, as well as working with the administration and the departments to ensure a more clear and predictable system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jim Welty, once again, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Marcellus Shale Coalition. Uh, we also have one of the bills that are in the package has been introduced by Representative Brian Ellis, who was not able to be here today. Uh, but his, his bill that he has introduced is House Bill 1960, and it's going to be known as the State Agency Regulatory Compliance Officer Act. And that legislation, uh, Representative Ellis will be, will be working with my committee and the other members that you're hearing from today to, to advance uh, with the package. Our next speaker is Representative Dawn Kiefer, and she's introducing House Bill 1237. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate you prioritizing regulatory reform. It's been one of the things I've been working on the hardest since I've taken office last year. Um, I come from the 92nd District, which covers parts of York and Cumberland County. And as a former small business owner and the wife of a small business owner and having many family members that operate small businesses as well, I can tell you from personal experience that overregulation disproportionately burdens small businesses. We're talking about businesses where mechanics will also serve as the janitor, as their bookkeeper, as their marketing director because they can't afford a team of attorneys and accountants on staff to navigate all of these rules for them. So they take much larger impact or a much larger hit than your bigger corporations who have these staffs of attorneys and accountants. The government's over overreaching regulations put small businesses at an unfair disadvantage and they create additional obstacles to their success. And it just doesn't make any sense because every minute 
that a business owner, small or large, spends navigating Harrisburg's role is a minute that they're not investing in their own business. And ultimately, it has a negative impact on not only their economic growth, but on the Commonwealth's economy as well. So I'm not saying that we should not ha have regulations and that the government doesn't have a role here. Absolutely, government must establish rules of operation that protect the general health and safety of Pennsylvanians. But when we're dictating things like the square footage of a car dealer's business, we've gone well beyond addressing health and safety concerns. So it's this hostile regulatory climate that served as the impetus of House Bill 1237. It's legislation that I authored, and it establishes an enhanced review process for economically significant regulations. And economically significant regulations are defined as having an impact, an economic impact on the state, municipalities, or the business community of $1 million or more per year. So under my bill, the legislature must vote on a concurrent resolution to approve an economically significant regulation before it may be implemented. It removes the power from unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats and places it back into the domain where it rightly belongs. So my desire to reform the regulatory environment in Pennsylvania and change how we do business is shared by many Pennsylvanians. And that was witnessed in the state government committee's in-depth examination of the regulatory climate here. Among the findings of the committees were initiatives that would improve the regulatory culture by stopping bad regulations before they are implemented. Testifiers at the, committee, at the committee's public hearings on the topic recommended that economic significant regulations not only be subject to approval by the legislature, as my legislation does, but that an independent entity, the Independent Fiscal Office, or the IFO, be charged with developing the estimate used to determine whether that regulation is economically significant or not. So my legislation will be amended to task the IFO with preparing the cost estimate. And additionally, the following initiatives aimed at stopping by regulations before they're implemented will be amended to my bill. And those are committees must hold hearings on economically significant regulations. Committees and the legislature must have adequate time to review and consider approving or disapproving regulations by ensuring the review periods include a sufficient number of legislative days. And last, the creation of a process to ensure that when proposing reg regulations, agencies have been given the explicit legal authority to issue such regulations, similar to what Mr. Welty was just talking about. I've been working with a group of legislators, we call ourselves the Common Sense Caucus, and we've been focused on an agenda that fosters and facilitates an economic growth in Pennsylvania. Specifically, we've identified regulatory reform as a key component to realizing sound economic growth in the Commonwealth, and we applaud Chairman Metcalf for his time and dedication to this issue. And I look forward to working with the Chairman and my colleagues here today to advance all of the important initiatives that we're discussing because I believe this is absolutely vital to the economic prosperity of the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Don Kiefer. Our next speaker is Mr. Kevin Sunday, and he is the Director of Government Affairs at the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the General Assembly, and representatives from leadership who are here today. It's an, it's an honor to uh, speak on this stage with you all. There's no question that the regulatory process at the state level needs fixed, and we, we support this broad effort to do that. Um, for far too long, at both the state and federal level, legislators have, a, have decided to yield far too much discretion to agencies to set policy and law. And make no mistake, a regulation is a law. It carries the full force of law, it defines particular obligations for businesses and individuals and carries with it the threat of significant fines and penalties for noncompliance. So with that in view, the question before us is the powers that the citizens have chosen to give to the legislative branch, who shall determine uh, what they meant when they set forth a law? Shall it be the branch of government directly accountable to the people or shall it be the bureaucracy or shall it be the courts? And the package of bills before us makes clear that that power should be vested with the legislature and we expect them to speak clearly as they are through these uh, package of bills to do that. 
I also want to talk about the, the federal regulatory process. It is burdening state government. There are a lot of unfunded mandata mandates that come down from Washington, D.C. We heard about the challenges from the Department of Environmental Protection. A lot of their permitting delays are because there are and there is just, in fact, uh, incomprehensible policies being sent down from Washington without clear interpretation from D.C. There's also unfunded uh, labor and, and environmental, educational, and welfare requ requirements being sent down. And we see these continuing to grow. The Federal Register is the official depository of all uh, new and proposed federal regulations. At the end of 2016, it, it totaled more than 100,000 pages, and that was a 20 percent increase year over year as the previous White House raced against the clock to pile on more and more regulations that state government is now, by and large, going to have to carry out with minimal federal assistance. So we believe that the federal process is gui it's guided by the Administrative Procedure Act, but that has not been updated in 70 years. There is legislation moving through Congress that would uh, adjust and update and modernize the federal regulatory process, which has to date established a regulatory burden of more than a trillion dollars per year on our economy. Uh, what this bipartisan legislation in Congress would do would require federal agencies to bring in the public sooner, and for billion-dollar-plus regulations, they need to make available the public, they need to make publicly available the data and research they're relying on and allow for a constructive dialogue about that research. And for all regulations, the agencies need to develop an honest cost-benefit accounting and pick the uh, least costly path forward. And so we understand that the General Assembly here in Harrisburg is working on resolutions that support that effort in Congress, and we applaud them for doing that, as well as working on these important pieces of legislation. And we applaud the members of the U.S. House who voted for the Regulatory Accountability Act, and we urge Senators Casey and Toomey to do the same in the United States Senate in the near future. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you, Mr. Sunday, Director of Government Affairs at the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. You'll next hear from our Appropriations Chairman in the Republican Caucus, uh, Representative Stan Saylor. Thanks, Darrell. I'm pleased to be here today with my colleagues who are sponsoring this legislation and those that are here in support of the legislation. You know, it's interesting uh, when you look at what's been going on. Uh, whether you're a small businessman or just a private citizen who has to deal with state agencies. You know, in my district, there was DEP came in and ordered a, a, a family to replace their septic system. So within two months, they had submitted a plan to the Department of DEP who had ordered them to do so. It took 18 months, no rejections, no word from DEP about the plan that had been submitted, but 18 months later, they approved the plan that was submitted. 18 months. This is a family who had spent money and needed to, to replace their septic system. Or what about PennDOT, who we, not too long ago, in, did a gas tax increase so that we could improve our infrastructure. An infrastructure which required, we put in three Ps, private-public partnerships. PennDOT awarded contracts, saving us millions of dollars for replacement of bridges all across Pennsylvania. Guess what? DEP delayed those projects constantly on a regular basis. Even though those projects, 500 of them in one bid, were identical projects. Again, we are constantly finding regulations and government agencies themselves not working together to save the taxpayers of Pennsylvania money. We lost 1,000 jobs from November of 2016 to November of 2017. 1,000 jobs in Pennsylvania. Big reason, overburdensome regulations. Again. It is time. Every, we're coming up on a new budget. We're coming up on an election year. And we hear every politician talk about creating jobs. I'm for jobs. I'm for jobs. The problem is nobody ever says how they're going to create jobs. You hear some of them who want to go out and raise taxes on businesses. Others who want to put more regulations on businesses and families. That's not how you create jobs. That's not how you pay for children with autism are people with physical disabilities. The way to do that is to create real jobs by lowering taxes, by staying within your means, and letting businesses operate in Pennsylvania like they do in other states. We've heard from the governor and others about raising taxes so we can spend more money. The way to raise more money is to create more jobs. We're family sustaining jobs who are going to pay the personal income tax or more people starting their own business because we know 80% of all jobs in Pennsylvania and across this nation are by small business people.
So by making it easier to start a business, easier to stay in business, we will raise the revenue we need to fund the priorities of this governor and this General Assembly. So it's time for everybody who talks about creating jobs to walk it and quit talking it. We need to grow our economy. We need to create jobs. These proposals by these members of the General Assembly and Chairman Metcalf and everybody else here today will help Pennsylvania be competitive, not only with other states, but competitive in this world with other countries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Stan Saylor from our uh, House Appropriations Committee. We are also joined by Ms. Beth Ann Mumford, and she is the State Director of Americans for Prosperity, and she's going to share some words with us today also. Uh, prior to her speaking, I want to announce that we're also joined by Representative Joswiak and Representative Zimmerman, who are also here in support of regulatory reform. Ms. Mumford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to start out by saying that I'm really excited to learn that after 300 and some odd years of unleashing liber liberty across the world, Pennsylvania finally has a common sense caucus that's looking at our legislative agenda to move this state forward uh, so that every citizen has a chance to thrive. Americans for Prosperity is a grassroots organization. Our job is to work in communities, help citizens uh, fight for and advocate the ideals of a free society. For us, that means a bias towards liberty and a bias against coercion. Uh, we work across a number of, of issues, but really helping citizens engage their lawmakers in moving good for policy forward in Pennsylvania. Um, I want to thank Chairman Metcalf and the other visionary leaders here today uh, who have put forward a really solid and visionary set of regulatory reforms for the state of Pennsylvania. Businesses across the state, as I travel, I hear often, they want, they want a, a regulatory policy that is predictable, that's transparent, and, and is accountable. And they don't have that right now. A number of legislators have talked about uh, how they are seeking to fix that. Americans for Prosperity is fully in support of the whole package of bills. We will be working in our communities uh, to help citizens uh, let their lawmakers know that this is something they want to see passed through the legislature and signed by the governor. But this really is about the citizens of Pennsylvania. We need robust economic growth to unlock the promise of our commonwealth. We need every single citizen to know when they get up in the morning that they have opportunity. They have opportunity in their communities. They have opportunity uh, for their homes, for their families, for their neighbors, for their friends to grow and thrive here. Uh, we don't have that feeling in a lot of communities. I travel across the state. Uh, people are really worried about uh, what's going to happen in the future, whether they've got kids in high school, kids in college, whether they're young workers themselves. They feel like other states are really kicking our butt and we don't get the chance here uh, to unlock that potential that each and every single person has to help their own communities thrive. Government should not be in the way of innovators and entrepreneurs, large and small. I've heard Kevin Shivers talk a lot uh, about his membership, a million small businesses across the state. And imagine if each one of them could just hire one more person. Those are community businesses uh, that could give every single person a chance in the community for a better life. Uh, so we'd like to see that. We think the regulatory system in place uh, as we talk to citizen, citizens across the state really holds holds back the kind of economic vitality that can help our state move forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker again. I thank the chairman. I thank all of the legislators here uh, who really are visionary reformers. We look forward to working with them to move this package of bills forward. Thank you. Thank you, Beth Ann Mumford with State Director for Americans for Prosperity here in Pennsylvania. Our next speaker is Mr. Carl Marrera. And he is the Vice President, Government Affairs at Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Carl. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm with the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, and that's the association that represents the people who make things throughout our Commonwealth. And I have a chance to talk to those people who make things. And it's funny, they have a very similar way of, of putting the same the same sentiment, but they consistently tell me that making their products is a lot easier than keeping the government happy? And the answer is simple to this puzzling 
question, and, and that's really, the, it's just excess regulation, and it shouldn't and does not have to be this way. It's not that manufacturers disagree with the spirit of these laws, the spirit of these regulations. It's that many are just quite simply afraid of the government and the gotcha mentality that regulators have with them. Our employers are looking for partners in regulation adherence, not for adversaries or fundraisers. Members of the business community recognize, though, that without a healthy and sustainable natural environment, it is difficult to maintain and attract high-quality employees. However, it is equally important to ensure that environmental regulation is approached on sound scientific evidence to ensure that regulations are reasonable and within technological limits. Quite simply, we don't think that state regulation should be more stringent than federal regulations unless there is a compelling reason that is unique to our commonwealth. It is imperative that Pennsylvania regulators not enact regulations that place Pennsylvania at a com competitive disadvantage to one of our competitor states. In the most recent Forbes Best States for Business, contributing um, to the overall ranking of 38th was our regulatory environment, and that's not good enough. Let's bring those businesses here with a government that works with businesses on regulation adherence. Business investment is ripe throughout the United States, and we want to see that Pennsylvania is open for business and bringing those investment dollars here. It should be the goal of Pennsylvania policymakers to make it the smart business decision to locate here in our commonwealth rather than one of our competitor states. And that's why we are so supportive of this package, uh, or this package of bills. And thank you, Chairman Metcalf, for putting this together. Thank you to Mr. Carl Marrera, again, Vice President of Government Affairs at Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Our uh, speaker that will be doing a cleanup for us here is Mr. Nathan Benefield. He's Vice President and COO at the Commonwealth Foundation. And I think that they, uh, they would fit well with the Common Sense Caucus because they put forth a lot of common sense for policy initiatives here in Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Benefield. Uh, thank you, Ch Chairman Metcalf. Uh, you know, these regulations that we are talking about have a very tangible effect on Pennsylvania workers and families. You know, we regularly hear stories from our energy sector of long waits for permits uh, and even an approval of compliance with regulations. Uh, these delays create more than simply a bureaucratic headache. Uh, they impact the lives of, of workers uh, and the livelihoods of thousands of Pennsylvanians. Job creators must slow hiring, delay projects, and even lay off workers as they wait on state agencies to get approval to simply start production. Uh, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics data, uh, Pennsylvania has lost 15,000 jobs in the mining and logging sector since 2015. These, that, that's nearly 40% of the workforce gone. Now, those job losses aren't entirely due to state regulations, but clearly our oppressive regulatory burden makes it harder for those businesses and the people they employ to get back on their feet. Or consider the case of Sally Ladd, whose business model was simply posting Airbnb businesses for her friends and neighbors. The Department of State tried to shut her down, saying that in order to post things on the internet, you need to get a realtor's license. Uh, Ms. Ladd refused to give in and is now has a lawsuit before the Commonwealth Court saying these regulations uh, violate her right to earn a living. Uh, the fact speaks, speaks volumes of our regulatory climate when we are having to argue these things in court of whether uh, these regulations allow individuals and small businesses to even earn a living. And then last week, uh, you see Governor Wolf declaring a state of emergency to deal with the opioid crisis. At least five of the changes he proposed through this declaration dealt with regulations. To be clear, Governor Wolf suspended regulations on health care providers. Why? Because he felt those regulations created additional obstacles for health care providers, doctors and nurses and pharmacists, to actually help people with serious drug addiction problems. We shouldn't have to wait for a crisis or declare a state of emergency to reevaluate the regulations that are harming businesses, entrepreneurs, and service providers. The bills being discussed today would allow the regular review of regulations to weigh their costs and benefits. If those regulations are truly necessary to protect the public safety, by all means, we should keep them on the books. But if they merely serve as obstacles to job creators, small businesses, entrepreneurs, families, and workers, we should remove those burdens that unnecessarily hinder job creation and our ability to serve Pennsylvania residents. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Nathan Benefield with the Commonwealth Foundation. Um, I'd like to thank all of our uh, members that joined us here today and all of the citizens from the outside groups, along with Dr. Brule, who came up from uh, George Mason University, uh, the Mercatus Center there, to, uh, to talk today at our press conference. Uh, we do, as I mentioned, have the regulatory overreach report that uh, announces the findings of the committee's work last year and also includes the legislative package. Uh, they should be available in the back. Uh, they should also be available on the web. Um, thank you all for being here today. Have a great day and uh, stay safe on those roads out there. Thanks.